I think it's because I muted them. Hello, 22 lessons for teaching critical thinking.
For example, in my in my I get medical treatment. For an, an hour at a time. And then we never see them again. Usually. I would say, unfortunately, but I don't see them. Again. So that I'm questioning what, what do I need to teach them? And I don't, I feel I don't have to teach them their 12 cranial nerves. And you know the eighth nerve is this and so on. That they can learn for themselves, or they should have learned for themselves. So I'm interested in what can I teach them that they haven't learned, or they didn't learn, or maybe they're unlikely to learn. And I say this is related to critical thinking. Next slide. Next. So uh, if my 50 year old patient wants to know what they can do to age well, let's say they have a familial risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, if I had 100 hours available to tell them what I would like her to know, that would be in my book on aging. But this is a, another thought experiment. If a 30 year medical student comes to my clinic and I have to talk to him for one day, what would I do? Or for years, as the neurology chair, I gave a one hour lecture on introduction to neurology. And it was a very difficult question. What is it I'm going to talk about for one hour? I have one hour. What my differential diagnosis of tinnitus? There's so many things you could do. But I wanted to teach them something that they might not learn if I don't do it. So I'm working on the second book, which I've called 125 Lessons in Critical Thinking Young Doc. And I don't have time here, of course, to have 25 lessons, but we got a few, maybe 23, as an example of what I would like to be teaching and what I am trying to teach uh, at the moment. Critical thinking is defined uh, as a rigorous type of thinking that makes fair and careful judgments based on evidence. And the goal of the whole process here is to be aware of thinking. I'm afraid most of us, especially younger people, um, just allow thought to happen without any consideration. How they're thinking, how they're making judgments, how they're perceiving, what they're paying attention to. And the goal is not necessarily to think in the right way and don't think in the wrong way, it's just to be aware of how you're thinking and what's influencing your conclusions, perceptions, and judgment. Next slide. So, my first lesson is rather uh, obvious at, in a way, but then not really, because it's not something that um, we do all the time. So, let's say we have a 74 year old alcoholic hypertensive man who smokes, who has a stroke. If you ask uh, a neurology resident or who knows any physician, why did he have a stroke? He'd say, well, it was a thrombosis for me. There was a blood clot. He had a blood clot. But what if I said, this guy's 78 year old older brother, who's also alcoholic, who's also hypertensive and smoked, and he never had a stroke? That little thought experiment shows that it's wrong to say that. The risk factors were positive. I mean, um, riding a motorcycle is a risk factor for head injury. If you fall off your motorcycle and you hit the ground with your head, and that, that's the cause. The responsible factors are more complicated. But it is wrong to associate the risk factors with the cause. The question I would, the better answer would be we don't know. Why he had a left metaphorical artery symbol. And a question I would ask if you're going to think about it think deeply is why did it affect his left and not his right? You know, through the artery. 
I'm not aware of any theory about this. And uh, I think it's likely the microbiota are involved because as we know there are a lot of bacteria in the mouth and the mouth flattering, flattering and uh, ears and sinuses, of course, are very close to the blood vessels. And we know that there's an association of uh, oral bacteria with stroke. With my uh, colleague in Osaka, who has just published a fourth paper. This one is in European Neurology last two weeks ago, showing the relationship between oral bacteria and hemorrhagic stroke. Another question is why does ALS begin with foot weakness in some patients and some get sort of and other various on, onsets of ALS. And as far as I know, there's no theory about this other than the fact that it's a random, a horrible, very tragic, but it's a random thing how it starts. So you won't be surprised to know I have a theory that it's because where the exposure takes place. So it's the interaction between the nervous system and the bacteria occur in the colon, it might go first to the spinal cord, causing foot weakness. It happens in, through the nose, through the olfactory receptors in the nose, to go directly to the brainstem, or uh, from the mouth to the brainstem, or from the uh, olfactory receptors to the medial temporal lobe to the brainstem, causing bulbar And the, I proposed this mechanism in this paper and again, the reason I like this is there's no other explanation that I've heard of other than the fact that it's just a random, unfortunate event. And with uh, my colleagues in Okorolawa, who is my postdoctoral fellow, we have a paper being reviewed painfully in scientific reports showing that oral that gut bacteria influence ALS in. Uh, G93A transgenic SOD model mice. And uh, then uh, let's say we have a 72 year old woman with Alzheimer's who has two E4 alleles, apological cancer. E4, that increases her risk 10 times. If you would ask probably any uh, knowledgeable neurologist, he'd say, ERC, he'd say, oh, this person has Alzheimer's because of these two genes. However, at age 80, 40% of people who have 2 e 4 are not dementia. So we know that you don't have to be, you don't have to have that gene to get Alzheimer's. You can have that gene and not Alzheimer's. So that this shows this is not the cause. Because of that, there has to be something else involved. And Unfortunately, if you ask a whole bunch of all time specialists, they all probably say, oh, it must be some other gene. Because we have this inappropriate and improper bias in favor of genes, uh, which are not responsible for everything. That was lesson number two, just in the number, um, that was one. number one. Number two, what determines what we perceive? So William James famously said that if you leave a pack of wolves in the British Museum for one year, they wouldn't learn anything about art. And they'd make a big mess. But they would experience the art. But the difference was is they're incapable of paying attention to what they are. So our experience does not define our existence, it's our attention. So the, the basic summary, at least in medicine here, is when we focus on the patient or the biomarker. This is rather sad, disturbing story, and maybe it's too early in the morning to have such a tragic, I mean, such a disturbing story, but Janet Woodcock, who was the head of the FDA, she said, 
when she approved that apparently for Alzheimer's treatment, even though it didn't help the patient. It did relieve the amyloid burden in the brain, but it didn't help the behavioral cognition of the patient. And she approved it for it. She actually approved it under her direction. And she said, fundamentally, we have to stop thinking empirical evaluation is the only way of evaluating food. And I looked up the word empirical, it means evidence. She's saying, well, we should not look for evidence all that. We should, we, we're looking for evidence too much. We should rely more on theory. I, I thought this was finished with Plato when I was out there. You want to know how many teeth in the mouth of a uh, horse? You should, look, you should look at mouth of Plato and talk about it. But she's going back and recommending the totality of that. We often have this problem uh, in mo monitoring patients so that we, we need to, or I want to teach context of this process of a lesson. A young doctor should be aware of the biomarkers. They should be aware of the MRI and the EMG and all of that. EMG, but they shouldn't think that's the same thing as patients. Also, in a uh, I took this picture and I put it on the wall in my office to remind me. So I, it might be a little hard to see, but there's a four headed cane and then two shoes. Each one has a number two in here. So this was an eight, four year old woman who came to see me who was obviously uh, unstable, meaning cane, and wearing high heel shoes. So now those are not really very high, but then I would prefer she had flat shoes. Get as much contact with them as possible. But uh, it's kind of a miracle. I noticed it because it's not something I usually put in my exam, you know, look at the shoes. But I might have, by telling her this, she said to me, Oh, Dr. Friedland, I was coming to see you. I told her she's eight, she's too old, she cannot wear these kind of shoes anymore. I, how many times have I seen patients who similarly were wearing the wrong shoes? I didn't know this because it's not something that I normally pay attention to. Which is why I put it on the wall of my office so I can uh, remember. This is an example of contextual errors. Uh, this book by Weiner and Schwartz says we must recognize the relevance of the patient's life context to plan and implement. Care. It's not, adjust, not enough just to give them my standard information. So I found the most commonly ignored aspect of the social history is what the patient likes to do when they're not working. So everybody knows, we all know we've got to ask about education and occupation. But then what about maybe they, they work, their patients and accountants, they have a CPA degree. And then the top is raising cats, and they have like 20 cats in their shoes to grow up. That might be something you want to know. So, a patient in Japan last year who had encephalitis from salmonella from a turtle, but nobody asked him about his pet. Then, this is to point out another the lesson here is these animals all have different ways of examining the world. Dolphins can use ultrasound without any machinery. And bees can detect the electric field of flowers. They didn't know flowers had electric fields, but six months ago somebody found flowers electric fields and it can be perceived by the bees and the electrical charges help the pollen to stick to the bees. And of course, um, echolocation at that can be, it shows we don't perceive the world the way it really is. That would be impossible. If I would go home from this meeting and, and be remembering what everybody here is wearing, it would be a big task, 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 task 
on my cognitive processing and memory capacity, which would be Similarly, a rattlesnake can perceive heat. We can't, we can't do that. We, we, we can't perceive it very good like a rattlesnake. So the point of that is we don't see the world the way it really is, which means we need to pay attention to how we see the world because of the errors, and we need to know that can affect our attention. So this heron uh, is not looking at all the colors of the different species. It's not important. It's looking for emulsions, which is the best clue to something which is which is and the best way to understand this is from evolution. The way our perceptual system has evolved is to enhance our survival, not to enhance our artistic capacity or to enhance our to enhance our ability to have children, something to eat, and to make have a thing. Because we don't see the world the way it really is, we need to pay attention to our perceptual processes. So, um, one aspect of that, I guess, is speaking for myself, I should enhance my attention to the patient and who, what shoes they wear. And a key aspect of this is here, lesson four, is listening. The lost, lost art of listening and ignoring the patient as a human being is a quintessential failure of healthcare. This is from Bernard Long, who uh, died a year or two ago after winning the Nobel Peace Prize. He has this remarkable book, which is now maybe 20 years old, uh, which you can buy for like $5 from Amazon News, The Lost Art of Healing. And he talks about the importance of listening to what the patient has to say. Uh, and I can admit it's not uncommon that I go to see a patient and have to ask, you know, what is your relationship with the patient and the patient's sister? Yeah, the patient we have to go to this. Oh. The, the problem was I asked a question, and when he's giving me the answer, I'm already thinking of my next question and not listening to what. This was uh, very well described by Osler, who was a Canadian doctor, and he worked at Hopkins and wrote the most important medicine textbook for the He said, uh, he didn't actually say it this way, but I'll put it like, she who studies medicine in that book fails in uncharted seas, like she who studies medicine without patients doesn't go to see at all. So, I was a neurology resident in Mount Sinai, and my teacher, I had two, two chiefs. One was Spencer, who was very interested in patients and pain attention. Then we were going, I was going on attending rounds out of the resident. We got a new neurology attending in Columbia. And our practice was to present the cases to the attending and then see the patient and then discuss the patient. So we, the attending came, we presented the patient, and before we were finished, he said, Oh, there's a paper in the Green Journal. That shows this, 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 this. Go look it up. And then we went, we got up and we were going to go see the patient. And he said, Where are you going? So we're going to go see the patient. So I already told you what the matter was. He was happy to make his diagnosis based on what he He didn't want to go. Also, I said, Listen to the patient. They're trying to tell you the diagnosis. So I have two examples of this. One man with right ulnar neuropathy, 25 years old. I didn't have any reason to explain why he had ulnar neuropathy. He didn't have diabetes. He wasn't alcoholic. And he didn't have a car accident. And the key thing was, I said to him after his EMG third visit, I said, did he have any idea why he had this? I said, well, maybe it's because I'm playing this video game that I broke my thumb and it's just like that over and over and over again. So this was my only knowing journal paper video game called 1984. 
I had a 35 year old man who had a radiculopathy. He, I didn't have any reason why he should didn't have, he should have that at an early age. He hadn't had any access or injury, and we did an EMG and an MRI scan, and nothing was wrong on the CT scan. But he had a pain. So I said, Did he have any reason to believe why he had a pain? He said, Maybe it's this yoga posture that I've been practicing. I said, Show me. And he got up on the bed, pounding the table, standing on his head with his neck bent. I said, Don't do it. <laughs> But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't like, asked them. This is, of course, it's not always just simple. But the idea is attention to the patient can tell you what it is. Uh, because the disease is common, but the patient is. And we need to listen to understand not only listen, uh, not only prepare what we what we're going to say next. Okay, for the next lesson, so this is Christopher Columbus and post of him. Anybody want to say what, what they have in common? Exactly, that's right. Thank you. They were, theories are not true or false, they are part of ourselves. This is the saying from Claude Bernard, who uh, is a great physiologist from France, a friend of uh, Louis Pasteur. And Columbus thought, we'll get to the to Asia by going west, and he was wrong. But, you know, it was less important. Post-it notes were invented in a search for a better clue. And as a clue, it's a failure because it doesn't hold very well. And when they found it, was it didn't hold very well. There was one guy there who was suited, and the company kept on telling him, you know, get lost, you know, it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. But he said, maybe you do. So post it notes are the largest product of the free income. And it's a failure in terms of this. So that both in research and clinical medicine, we shouldn't be worried that much about having our theories be wrong, because they could still be very valuable, even if it was too general. I think it might be, maybe we should do the final test and do that. So you were wrong, but you might have to discover something else. So we need to be open to this idea that a theory is not true or false. And uh, Claude Bernard recognized the importance of balance, which is uh, a key factor in aging because homeostasis becomes more and more fragile after all this sort of the decline of business quality. Lesson six. My other chairman is now Simon of uh, Melbourne, New York, who I will say very little about other than to tell the story that he went to see a 34-year-old woman who had a headache and a blurred vision. And she hadn't entered in at the time there was no CT because of it. And showed she had a brain tumor. And we went on rounds with the chair. Uh, so there, as you know, you know, there's the chair and the tending and maybe five residents and four medical students were going on home. Bed to bed to bed. And go to see this woman. And she has a chair next to her bed. She says, Dr. Yar, please have a seat. And he says, no, I don't need to sit down. Thank you very much. And he puts his arm on the shoulder and says, Intergen shows you have a brain tumor. The neurosurgeon will be there in two hours. He starts to cry. And he leaves the room. And in the hall, he tells us to observe this pseudo vocal affect and emotional incontinence caused by the loss of inhibition. And I still feel such. I guess it's, I'm angry. At this guy who was unable to appreciate the emotions of another person. He had an intellectual, this is called intellectual addiction, where you, uh, instead of allow emotions to develop, you, you find words for them. Using reason and logic to avoid uncomfortable anxiety provoking. Using thinking to avoid 
the boy is healing. There's no reason to believe she had a suitable bubble. She just was here to come back. Bad news. And the other part here is um, it's a rule he must be sitting down and giving back. It was rude for him not to have accepted her offer there. She knew something was going to come out of it. And he wanted to have a serious conversation. He didn't, he wasn't willing to have a serious conversation. Uh, another lesson. Uh, this is the best summary of this is which is all the stories or books. This is a very obvious. Some question, but it points out that we've had books for several hundred years, and in, until the 20th century, most people on earth were illiterate. However, we've been telling stories for tens of thousands of years. Nobody knows exactly when language developed, but certainly tens of thousands. Of years. Imagine a a clan in Norway. 15,000 years ago, where they have five children and one of them just doesn't pay attention when he's drinking. He has a gene or complex. He, he doesn't like so he, he doesn't, he just wants to play with his toes or whatever, play with the salted fish and he doesn't pay attention. And then something bad happens, like they have a drought or a flood, and he doesn't remember what the grandparents told him about how to respond to this and he died. So the, Passing on the genes for not paying attention to stories would be lower. And unlike his, his siblings, who hopefully were paying attention to every word that all people said. So, my only point here is paying attention to stories is a function of the brain, is part of our genetic inheritance. So when I look for a movie to watch and on Netflix, I'm astounded there are so many movies. And we could, I wouldn't say anything about how good or bad they are, but it's just a, the fact, the reason there's so many movies is people like stories. And it's not, it is a, a part of our evolutionary inheritance because paying attention to stories is that. And what I want my the students to know is that attention to the patient is a better way to learn than attention to the book. To the book. Not that we shouldn't and they shouldn't read books, but they could learn better from the patient. And if they have an opportunity to learn from a the patient, they should take it. They also should read books, but it's better for the for learning on a human neurological evolutionary basis. To learn from patients. So I'm sure you've all seen this experience where with a patient and a student, and I get the patient, I said, Would you please come in? I'd like to see you walk. So they, I take them out in the hall to walk, and the student is sitting there. And then the student, the patient comes back and says, What did you think of this case? And the student says, I didn't see What will then by you? And I remember what I would have been, what they would have said to me if I did that. You know. And uh, we had a student last month. We discussed the case with the nurse. Then we said, okay, let's go see him. And we go, I'm going to nurse and me and the students, and we go. And then the student, before we get to the room, he goes this way and says, I'm going to have lunch. I asked him later, what happened? You know, why did you come to this? He said, I was hungry. And I wrote a note in his record that we, the neurology department, will not take him. Of course, he might not. He said he was interested in neurology, but we're not. He, he, so, but it's just astounding that uh, if they learn something from a patient, they will remember it better than if they learn it from And this is part of the way evolution has prepared the brain for appreciating the story. And William also says this. He said every student should have a little book. I still have a I have a little book. 
I have bought a whole bunch of these and I give them to the team. Not particularly this one, but having a little book means you can write things down. And when uh, something happens, and you think it's like, well, why is that? What is that? You can write things in here. If you, you see a patient uh, during the day and you read about it at night, you will remember that better than if you read it you know, a month later when you're studying for something. And the, the mind does not work in it. rational thinking is only one kind of thinking. It's not uncommon. I'm driving in the car. I'm, not, I'm thinking about something. I'm listening to the radio, and that doesn't start to say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, geez, did I, that patient with proptosis I saw last week? Did I think of doing an MRI or something that can occur?" And if you write it down, unless you have a memory in which you remember everything at all times. And uh, every time I see a new patient, I read a new book. Lesson number eight. Rare presentations of common events are more common than common presentations of rare events. This is very hard for me to explain to Japanese colleagues when I was there. I like to work like to say it in English and let them translate it and they didn't get it. But it's very important because we think about Kreisel, you know, because it's a very interesting disease. It's very uncommon. So if you had 100,000 people, you might have five to 10,000 of Alzheimer and less than one with Kreisel. So that, that doesn't mean, you know, the patient could have, get have Kreisel, but we should think about the, the uh, probability. And, um, the, neuro the neurologists who, in the room who are not actually in the room, but they would know my obsession with this idea that words influence the way we think. So if you ask me if there's an elephant in this room right now, actually any size elephant, baby, adult, I could look around, I could look under the table, and I could look in the closet. There is no elephant. I've eliminated the possibility. The chance that it's an elephant is zero. So I ruled out elephant species. But we can't do this in medicine. Or very rarely. So uh, intracranial bleeding usually causes blood in the spinal fluid, but not always. So if you do a spinal tap and there's no blood, you have not ruled out in physical hemorrhage. You've provided evidence against the presence of it. So my fear is that we will, the words influence thought in very strong manner. And this is uh, the Sapir War theory of language, which implies that words or thought is determined by words, which is probably wrong, but we know certainly the words of thought is influenced by words. And we have to pay attention to that. Language is not only a device for reporting experience, but a way to define it. Another example. Next slide. Next. An example of this is just an example of how important words are. Putin has all ordered the special military operation, and he doesn't want to, he can't say in Russia, apparently, he can't say it's an invasion. This is just an example. Of how important words are not only medicine and science, but in politics. Uh, this would be one of my most uh, important lessons, but one I'm most concerned with. Why would a student not get up and see how a patient walks? I mean, I don't, uh, I want them. To be feared. They think they're going to learn by osmosis because they're present that they will learn. So, when in the old days, old days like a year ago, two years ago, when I gave lectures to the medical students class, and there'd be 100 people, uh, well, there'd be 30% of the class attending, and they'd all sit as far away from me as possible. And I would say, I have no infectious conditions. 
and have seats in the front for the same time. Why would they sit in the back? And they're all on, you know, on an iPad at one talk. So I want them to be fierce. And I want them to nurture an intense or ferocious aggression in the pursuit of their learning and in the pursuit of the patient's benefit. And actually, if we could give them an inoculation uh, and you can do that to the, to the shot, that would be not possible. How? So, how to do this? I don't know. I thought this is, could be a symbol of the kind of progressiveness I'd like to be pursuing their own learning. So here's an example. If they're in, if the medical student is in the OR and the patient has some problem and they get admitted to neurosurgery, the next day they're let's say they're they're still in the ER. I'd like them to go find out what happened to that patient and learn what happened to that patient. And if they went to the OR, I'd like them to go. Go with the bell bar. I mean, of course, with the permission of the neurosurgery, because are we woke? Right? Oh, you're always woke. But the chance that this happens is, is very close to zero. Because medical students are they're just so passive, they're just observing what happens, and uh, you want to uh, get them to nurture the intense and ferocious aggressiveness. They go pursue their learning, learn, learn what happened to the patient. And, uh, Particularly uh, emergency room doctors, I can't understand how they could practice and not learn what happens to their patients because they're seeing them once and then and never seeing them again. And I've had times when I would give them feedback about what happened. They don't really, they don't seem to be interested. How could they practice medicine without any experience? So I thought this is an example of what I kind of ferocity in the benefit of the patient. So that if they read something and uh, somebody from Thailand publishes a paper about the these are the patients they have and they have a question, I want them to be fierce in the pursuit of the patient's benefit. Go write a, write an email to that doctor from Thailand if you don't understand the paper. The worst thing that could happen is they won't answer. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of the fire. But it's only those things which you notice the attention determine experience. Uh, lesson number 11 is the key factor. The key factor which determines our what we perceive is our opinion. And uh, we need to pay attention to that. We need to uh, have this snake. Actually, there are two snakes in my book. One on the bottom and one in Japan. Actually, a serious poison snake. But again, the uh, snake is observing what's moving, not the uh, colors or sounds, particularly not the sounds since it doesn't have any ears. Now, uh, bias is important, and the key factor about bias is if you can't avoid it, it's part of human nature. What is important is to be aware of the kind of bias you have. And this lesson involves various forms of bias, particularly how the way information is presented influences thought. So if you if you have a student and you'd like the student to be a patient, don't tell the student what they're diagnosed. That will train the daily interaction. So I have a rule that I will never look at an MRI scan before I see a patient. Of course, if it's in the ER and broken, it's different depending on the situation. But if you're seeing an outpatient, you might be biased by the pathology in the MRI and not uh, look at the patient with an open 
Similarly, if you read an EG, it's best to read it first without knowing why the EG is done. Then you learn about the innovation and see how that might fit with what's described. Uh, because having preconceived ideas is a form of bias. Uh, we're all kind of biased in favor of common conditions because that is our experience. But there are some physicians I know who, who just like to make rare uh, diagnoses, especially if it makes them look good, or if they know more about things. Uh, so, my chair, Dr. Yar, liked to say uh, patients had paraneoplastic transversmyelitis because he wrote a paper about that and he made that diagnosis every few months and he was always wrong. Uh, there's also experimental bias. Rosenberg and colleagues showed that if you tell students testing intelligence of rats, that this group of rats is very smart. They were bred over the years to be very smart. And this group of rats are quite dumb. Then you give them students to test, even though. The testing is done electrically, not by hand. They'll find that the bias that the students have gets transmitted to that. So that uh, double blinding is very important. And uh, I think this could be a big factor in the old time and drug studies because they have significant side effects in patients and guests. They are in the treatment group or not. And um, we go back one. Right, so in the study about intracranial calcification, we had to, uh, we were looking at the pineal gland and choroid type calcification or mineral location. But we would be biased by noting that cortical atrophy in all time patients and the lack of cortical atrophy in healthy people. So in order to get rid of this bias, we had aluminum foil made so that you could only see the center of the scan and you could see the cortical atrophy. Lesson 13, look beyond the easiest options and pursue the best resource options. Solomon Carter Fuller was a African-American from Liberia who came to the United States around 1890 and he trained in pathology in Boston and realized that he didn't know that much about neuropathology, so he wanted better training. He ended up going to work all time in Germany, which at the time was one of the best labs in the world. So the idea is. Uh, I would like students to look for the best opportunities possible. Lesson 14, pay attention to the assumptions of the diagnostic testing and research evaluation. This is particularly true if you think about functional MRI is based on the difference between metabolism and blood flow. That metabolism increases with activity and blood flow increases more than it should. So it's it's not a direct measure of activity. It's a direct measure of something else. Stuart Shallot wrote this famous paper on Alzheimer's disease where he found that uh, smoking was a risk factor because his patients were all veterans and his controls were all non veterans As you know, veterans uh, were required to smoke by the uh, My former lab chief did Stanley Rappaport did the study in Down syndrome showing that they had a higher metabolic rate, higher rates of glucose metabolism. And that was why they got Alzheimer's, paper 93. 
but where they didn't measure was the attenuation of the radiation from the head caused by the fact that the jump syndrome head was small. We generally assume the patient's family has the best interest of the patient in mind. But that's not always the case. And the tragic example of this. And next slide. Thanks. This is a neurologist who was killed by cyanide poisoning in 2013. This is a group published in the And she went to work. Uh, I think she was working at Penn, Philadelphia, and she, she got very sick. She went to the hospital. And I can't imagine uh, if the people who saw her there in the ICU first night were considering whether she had been poisoned. I think that I, I have no idea. And her husband was working the cyanide in the lab. He's a basic scientist. And the bill says he's not guilty and he's in prison for life. He's undoubtedly planning some of the appeal. And of course, I have no idea if he did it or not. But uh, my only point is that when we see patients in the ICU walls, even in clinic, you know, sometimes the patient, usually the family wants the best for the patient. Sometimes the family would like the old idea. Dead already, and they want to vote on the policy. It is not enough to just assume that. Um, but the idea is we only have one patient. The family is not our, our patient. The patient is the only one which we could consider the needs of the family, but we consider primarily the needs of the And I think I will conclude. Uh, Lesson number 17, ask why. And this is kind of sad. But the 78 year old man, he fell and he had a hip fracture. And what is the orthopedist going to do? He's going to fix it. He or she is going to fix it. Right. But well, is anybody going to ask, why did he fall? These are, there are more things to be put down there. But I'm not sure how many orthopedists pay attention to this. Uh, I had a I had an old aunt who at uh, at 93 she had a stroke, and everybody said uh, she fell down the stairs. Get into people hemorrhage, and she lived a few months and died. And I was, went to visit her uh, children, and I met her neighbor who said she was there when she fell, when she had the, fell and hit her head. And she was, they were standing at the top of the stairs when she suddenly jumped in the air and fell down the stairs. Why an you know, old woman would jump in the air? She must have had a stroke, and you know, so it wasn't caused by the fall. But she, so that there are reasons behind these things which are so important. And of course, uh, many of these things could cause the fellow to fall again after he goes home and gets his hip repaired. Next slide. Uh, I would be uh, grateful for your feedback either to email or uh, questions, if there's anything that you would add to the, to the discussion about what you want a student to be taught, you only had an hour, or if you had more time than we have now, what is it they need to know that they're not going to learn from books? Yeah. Another question. You know, so I've been thinking a little bit about teaching in the era of chat GPT. That I think over the last 20 years, a significant shift in how we acquire information. 
you know, you would go to the library and have to pull all this out of that, and, and that's become very easy when you call and you ask any question, you know, what you want. Now with, you know, AI being able to produce, you know, this summarizing, like gather that information for you, what, you know, that's going to be utilized hopefully in meaningful ways. What, what do physicians need to know now? I think critical thinking is even more important uh, than, than memorization. How do you think about that? Then get work. Right. Um, so, um, I hope that AI is going to come in our clinics and that there'll be a computer in every room. I mean, a, I mean, a camera. So, if the patient walks in like this, we AI will tell the doctor, you know, this is their problem. Of course, this is trivial for us, but not for some primary doctor and community who maybe has neurology school. So, uh, but it, it's already a monument, monumental problem because we have no input in it, which on top of it. So, I remember the first, when it started, there was a users group meeting, and I went to the first users group meeting, and so I had a lot of complaints. Everybody else agreed with me. We all agreed that there were like these 10 problems. And then a month later, I said, when is the next users group meeting? And they said, oh, we're not having any. They really don't care about that. But uh, yeah, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any answers. And similarly, now that the patient is learning everything we have to say about them, they're getting a report from the MRI that the radiologist thinks is Alzheimer's disease. Maybe I don't think so. They're going to learn that from the radiologist and they're going to freak out at home, maybe on a Friday night and, and then call me on Monday and say, oh, I'll say, I don't agree with that. I didn't really want them to be told. You don't want them to know they have a brain tumor from, from an email. And, uh, Yeah, I don't know how we could fight against uh, and then the information toxicity is another one. Yeah, thanks. But the, what I noticed, and I'm so envious of residents today that they could work what they are right there in the clinic. Uh, you know, they see a patient and they have a question, they can look it up. I mean, that's a, an incredibly valuable learning opportunity to be able to connect it. I had a little book, and I would have to write my questions down. And then only when I got a chance to go to the library could I look these things up. And I think it's probably better that they could look it up right then and there when it happens and, you know, connect it. But, uh, with, with, with everything, there's upsides and downsides to it. I, I don't think we should ignore the enormous upside of, of these um, that people just think are aiming for. That's much more than that computer on the uh, Apollo 13. You know. Yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, I I think this is, I agree with you. I think this is fantastic. I think even something like Chad GPT will be a Positive for yeah, I don't know enough uh, about chat PPT, but they can they they are synthesizing for you. Oh yeah. So I mean it, it essentially gathers information from the web and it, it creates in, in whatever format you like, you know, write write me a summary of you know the treatment of psychological analysis. Yeah. So now we're I mean our our, our the the danger is that that you're going to be limited by I, I think it emphasizes the, the sorts of things that get covered, which is, you know, what, what really is important is is judgment, is insight, is you know, compassion. Yeah. Yeah. How do you use? Yeah. And those are things that this is not going to provide. And so these things have become easy. Yeah. We have to teach for that them. part. To, to, you know, 
we, we don't teach anymore. Hey, this is how you go when you lose your subject because that's become relatively people. Sorry, what, what's wrong with this? Anybody online can write other. No, no, I'm trying to I mean, obviously, drawing our attention to the chest, but there's something peripheral, probably, that it needs to know. No classic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I see the acromion. I see the acromion, but not the clavicle. No, I study of. Of like 100 radiologists, they show, had a patient with one clavicle and missing on the left side. 90% got it and 10% missed it. But AI would have no problem with something like that. Yeah. But I'm um, the disturbed that our radiologists are still reading the x rays like they did 100 years ago, in my opinion, because they're like reading for it. And uh, they don't have to do that. They could, they could give them a quantitative analysis. Okay, great job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to put any little feedback. Hey, Paul, are you other uh, questions? Yeah, Paul, you can go back to your slides. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank because I, you know, a lot of times what you're saying about medical students kind of being in the ER, kind of being passive, just waiting for something to occur, maybe not necessarily actively pursuing parts of their education. I remember, I guess, it's been a while now that I was in medical school, but it was like a lot of the demands of whatever you had to do in school made it difficult to take on some of the active engagement and ownership for a patient. Not to say that it didn't happen and not to say that people were not, you know, actively engaged and fierce, but what can medical institutions do to kind of foster this type of thinking? Uh, that's a very good question. And um, I, I've had uh, resistance. I, I told the, the neurology department we should require the residents to sit in the front row. And the people in charge of the residency seem like they have the Right to sit in the back if they want. But um, when I was a resident, you know, we had to sit in a certain place. The, uh, I, I think we should we should be allowed to have more precise uh, questioning and uh, blaming. They don't know something; they they should know. We're, we're so protective of them nowadays. And, I mean, if I ask a question and nobody knows, often I ask a question and it's something I've already thought of. You know, 10 minutes later, 10 minutes later, I ask them a question that I taught them already and nobody wants to give it to me. Um, well, I, I think that's so I didn't answer your question. Then. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful, provoking, and mutual.